Hi everyone, today we're talking about uh, information from our first reading on the Great Believers. We're going to split this up into three videos just so it's a little bit shorter, a little bit less overwhelming, and can kind of stay on one topic at a time. So in this video, we're going to be talking about allusions and references that come up in this first section of our reading in the first roughly 100 pages. Um, just as a reminder, a reference is usually more outright. It'll, you know, for example, today it'll be when somebody's in a museum and then they talk about a painting and the artist that did it. Those are direct references that come up in the work. An illusion is usually more subtle. It's usually not explicitly stated or it's partially stated. So maybe the book talks about a specific painting by title, but then there's deeper meaning about the artist themselves and their history that corresponds with what we're reading in the book, something like that. So we'll go over a few together. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them as much as I, I could, and we can do that on office hours if you really want to nerd out about this book together, but let's start with some that I just thought were really, really key. Some you might recognize, and I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence if one of them is obvious to you, just want to make sure we're all on the same page about some things that are really key. So the first one comes up right away on page five when they refer to the Mask of the Red Death. Um, they say it's like that Poe story, the Red Death one. There's death out there, but we're going to have a fabulous time in here. Right away, if you know anything about Edgar Allan Poe, you know that this reference is really macabre. It's going to bring a certain eerie or spooky tone to things, right? So you know it's not this fun-filled moment, not that you probably thought the funeral scene was anyway, but just to reinforce that. Um, yeah, so Mask of the Red Death, it's a short story, like they say, where death is outside, and so everybody, you know, decides that they'll have a party together, and as long as they can keep death out, they're safe. Um, spoiler alert, doesn't quite work, but there you go. Another important reference I thought on page 12 is when they talk about Kierkegaard, uh, the narrator mentions Teddy and Julian would occasionally have a thing on, but mostly Teddy just floated between Kierkegaard and bars and clubs. I think this is a really important outlook into Teddy's mindset. Uh, Kierkegaard was the father of existentialism, which was a philosophical belief that life just has no inherent meaning, that you can create meaning, right? That's what distinguishes existentialism from nihilism, but that in and of itself, life doesn't come with an inherent meaning. So I think that's just important to keep in mind about Teddy. Uh, lots of art, especially in these first hundred pages, and that will continue to come up. Obviously, as a result of the professions of a lot of these characters, the passions of a lot of these characters. Um, I believe this one comes up when they're describing, I think, Richard's house. They mention a Diane Arbus print on the wall, the one of the boy with the hand grenade. So here's a picture for that. Um, Unless there have been better images released, this is not um, me being bad at formatting my slides. This is where the photograph ends. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can draw your own conclusions from this. I'm sure you have an emotional reaction right away. And if we were meeting in person, we could spend more time fleshing that out together. But I know for me right away, I noticed kind of the clawed hand here, this grimace this kind of like playground image, but then instead of a toy, the grenade. Um, important things to think about, right? The concept of a grenade being something lethal and loaded and not going off yet, maybe not actively dangerous, but the idea that at any moment it could be completely life-altering. Another one comes up when Fiona's on the plane talking to her seatmate and she's talking about visiting Richard, right? He says, I get him mixed up with Richard Avedon, but Campo did those deathbed shots. He's the one, Fiona responds, and she says, greater than Avedon. Um, this is an example of a photograph by Richard Avedon. Obviously, there were many. I find this one to be really striking with the eyes looking directly into the camera. Um kind of stillness and except for this furrowed brow, like a calmness that I do not think I would maintain if I was in this situation with what looked like bees all around me. Um, and so although we don't get picture references in the book to what Richard's photographs look like, I think this is really telling to say that his were grittier than something like this. 
This painting comes up when Yale is talking about one of his acquisitions at work, uh, mentioning that a man was set to donate at Jasper John's, numbers stacked in a glorious mess of primary colors until he learned the current value. So this is that painting that they're referring to, and this is the one that was supposed to be donated, but kind of eludes Yale's grasp, which I think is really interesting, not just to think about the art that does exist in this world of the characters of the great believers, but the art that escapes them. So not just what kind of shows how their life looks, but what shows the opposite of that, right? We have that the this color painting is what was out of reach for Yale. Um, a lot of everything so far in his world has been black and white. A lot of the references black and white. So this thing in vivid color escapes him. I think it's also important noticing that there's a certain nice order to this, right? It's a numerical order. We know what to expect. There's a certain organization and predictability about it. Um, that escapes Yale, which I think is also really telling with what he's going on, where things are unpredictable in his life right now. Some other kind of not art-related allusions and references, we get a lot about Princess Diana, talking about how Cecily had a Princess Diana haircut, soft and voluminous. Um, I'm sure with everything coming out right now on TV and in movies, you have an idea of what that looks like, but if not, here you go. Uh, this is especially helpful when we have different timelines throughout a book. Um, we'll find that there are a lot of references like this to really root one scene in one timeline or the other. So especially when we're talking about the late 80s, referencing this can be something that can kind of help. Another reference that comes up is Virginia Woolf. Um, this comes up when I believe Fiona and her husband are at the beach and their daughter is just walking into the ocean. They talk about how she's Virginia Wolfing herself and they talk about it kind of casually as a joke. Um, Virginia Woolf was a famous author, um, but she drowned herself by filling her pockets with stones and just walking into a river. So to have that joke about your daughter, I think, is really insightful first of all, about what Fiona's relationship is like with her own daughter and kind of the disconnect and, um, yeah, kind of the untraditional emotional connection that they have. But then also I think it's important to keep in mind what kind of tendencies towards self-destruction or risk-taking her daughter may have. Another piece of art um, this is the quote that this comes from. It says he'd planned to explain that it was Caravaggio's Saint Jerome that had sent vibrations down his arms, made the rest of the world fall away. Caravaggio's light, oddly, and not his famous shadows. This is kind of a throwaway line if you don't know the painting, but I think it's really important and insightful. So this is the line where Yale is reflecting on what he wanted to tell his dad for why he wanted to major in art history, which he ultimately did not end up doing. He, right, he studied finance and now has kind of this job where he gets to do both. So obviously Caravaggio is known for the darkness in his paintings, right? We have really this solid black, and then where it's not solid black, we have this really, really dark red. And so kind of the first instinct, or at least my first instinct seeing this painting and seeing that this was, you know, Yale's desire to get into art or it spurred that desire to get into art, it makes it seem almost like there's you know, a darkness, like he's kind of the tortured artist spirit. But instead we get that it's the light and not the shadows that brought him in, which I think is really interesting because there is so little light and yet he's still able to find it. So while we are early in the book, little things like this can tell us a lot about characters in a beautiful way other than just saying he was optimistic, right? This is something that I think does that a lot more elegantly. Um... Flipping back and forth because we're trying to keep in chronological order as best as possible, for the book at least. Uh, Whole House is mentioned. This is in Chicago. I believe it's a museum now if you are ever finding yourself there and want to visit. It was founded as part of a progressive social movement in the late 1800s um, where it was meant to be a place that people could stay, could seek shelter, could have all these different programs. Um, really just a safe space for a lot of people that couldn't find one otherwise. So I find it interesting that this is where um, 
they are able to go, a couple of characters meet to go swimming. And so I think it's kind of cool that, you know, the safe haven still exists, so to speak. Hamlet is also mentioned on pages 82 to 83. And without me even explaining anything, I'm sure you know Hamlet is a tragedy, maybe the most famous tragedy of all time. So again, uh, indirectly kind of setting the tone, setting the scene for what's most likely going to happen. Some of the main themes of Hamlet are mourning and loss and revenge. Um, another thing mentioned on 84, this is a really casual line, but I think it's really important to know about the history of LGBTQ representation and treatment, and that was gay panic. Um, they mentioned this, right, saying that somebody's going to claim it's gay panic and get away with something. This was, and in some cases still is, a legal defense where basically you could just say that if you assaulted somebody who you thought was gay or part of the LGBTQ community, you could say that it was because you panicked because you thought that they were trying to come on to you or something. And so that's why you punch them or hit them or whatever. Um, obviously not something that is ethically okay, not something that makes sense, not something that justifies any actions from a moral sense. However, this legal defense is still permitted in federal courts. Um, there have been recent attempts to ban it, but 2018 and 2019 attempts failed. Um, if something happened this year, let me know. I might need to update this, but I haven't heard of anything yet. Um, California was the first state to ban this defense, so good news for California. Not so good news that happened in 2014, which seems much too late. Um, it's also banned in some other states that you can see down here, but these have all happened more recently than 2014. Another illusion that comes up is Valhalla. That's on page 89. Um, Richard mentions, I don't know when I died, but this is my Valhalla, right? I believe talking about the Paris scene that he's in. Uh, in Norse mythology, there are two halls that you go into in the afterlife. So kind of like two realms of heaven, so to speak, kind of mixing terms from different mythologies. Um, Valhalla was the one that you went to specifically if you died in combat. So not that, again, Richard is trying to make this big statement, and I'm not implying that he's trying to say that he died in combat, but the choice of the author to use Valhalla as the reference and not the other Norse hall, I think is important to show how many people felt like they were kind of in combat against this disease. And then I believe our last one is Le Marais. This is a neighborhood that comes up in Paris. Um, it really is a mix of worlds. It's old and it's new, right? You have really old, uh, very classic looking Parisian buildings alongside very new modern ones, lots of cultures that are mixing. So I think it's an interesting choice for a neighborhood, right? Again, this idea of inclusivity and safe space. And that's it for this first video, as you kind of saw on the next slide already. Um, we'll be talking more about main characters in another video, um, but those are our key allusions and references.